Hello, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. One of the reasons I love making this podcast for you every other week is because I know what it's like to feel like you're not quite in the right place. I mean, people are nice, and I love my friends, but I have a different connection with other artists. When artists get together, they light up. Normally shy or introverted people suddenly become animated and hard to shut up. That's how I know I found my tribe. You know what I mean, right? It's like Helen said in an iTunes review. When I found this podcast, it made a world of difference. Now I feel in touch again with artists. I have my peeps, and they're here. So you most definitely are not alone, even if it feels that way when you're in your studio. And now you can connect directly with me and a group of seriously dedicated artists in Growth Studio, my ongoing mentorship program. Growth Studio is a place for artists to hone their skills and discover who they are as an artist in a supportive community. It's a place where artists can get honest feedback from their peers, trade ideas, and ask the burning questions that pop up when you're trying to get to the next level with your art. You know, the questions you want to ask, but you kind of feel silly because you mistakenly believe a real artist would already know that. Growth Studio isn't for everyone, but if it sounds like it might be for you, head over to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshops to learn more and apply. I'm opening a few more spots in the Growth Studio soon. This week, my guest is Bartosz Beda. He's originally from Poland, but he relocated to the UK to study at the Manchester School of Art. And as you'll hear, he has lived all over the place. Bartosz paints abstract figurative works that address social and political issues. In this episode, we talk about the 725 project he's working on during his residency at Goggle Works in Reading, Pennsylvania. Minimum wage there is $7.25. So Bartosz is doing a painting a day in one hour and selling it for $7.25. In this episode, Bartosz shares his experiences with artist residencies, specifically how and why he chooses them. Bartosz is intensely curious and observant. After a trip to New York, he knew he had to get serious about his work. Because after all, no one else would do the business side of it for him. He realized it was all up to him. So he set out to study other artists' successes and then formulated his own strategies. Recently, Bartosz founded Execute Magazine, an online magazine for artists. And as you'll hear, Bartosz has a strong work ethic and is dedicated to his painting practice. But even he sometimes procrastinates. So we talk about how he moves through procrastination, the value of taking a break, and the value of allowing ideas to gestate. Here is Bartosz Beda. Bartosz, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm delighted to talk with you today. Uh, Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. When did you start pursuing your art as your vocation? When I was seven. Seven years old, uh, my older brother, 12 years older brother, uh, he was drawing and painting a lot at that time. And uh, as a youngest, um, I was a little bit jealous about his skills. And I remember that when he was away, I was copying his drawing and paintings in a very mature way. When I was nine, my parents sent me to a teacher. And then after that, I pursued uh, this way of drawing and painting, and they sent me to private secondary arts art school in Poland, which was uh, focusing at that time on traditional drawing and painting. So I built up my skills uh, there. Uh, Shortly after that, uh, I worked at the movie studio where I was involved with uh, stop motion animation, and I worked there for two productions. One was Ichtis by Mark Skrebetsky, and the second one was uh, Peter and the Wall by Susie Templeton, which got an Oscar prize in 2008, I believe. And uh, in around 2007, eight, I moved to the UK to study at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. I completed there my MA, BA, And shortly after my graduation, I went for a scholarship at Dresden Academy of Art in Germany. And then I moved to the United States. So now I live and work in the United States. 
So you've been bouncing all over the place, sounds like. Yeah, it looks like, yes. So um, two years ago, I also uh, received a fellowship uh, Fundazione Per Arte in uh, Italy, in Rome. And I loved it there. And uh, I wanted to do a residency this year. And uh, this opportunity came to me for 10 weeks residency at uh, Google Works in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, which is uh, actually a wonderful uh, center. And I'm uh, glad to be here now. Can you talk a little bit about that process? This is something that we haven't really talked about on this podcast too much. And I know a lot of artists are really curious about it. What was your experience, both seeking out fellowships and residency and applying to them? So I guess let's start first with how did you select the residencies and the fellowships that you've been applying to? The scholarship to Dresden Academy of Arts was actually, I was awarded with that scholarship for six months. So that's not necessarily something I applied for. And then after that, um, I uh, didn't really plan on doing other residencies, but uh, I definitely, that's something that was on my um, on my list to do. And uh, I usually try to apply for those residencies that have interesting uh, place to be. So that was maybe the reason uh, for me to apply as well. And uh, with the fellowship in Rome, it was also it's a very interesting story too, because this residence is funded by uh, two collectors who have this uh, wonderful idea of bringing contemporary artists to Rome, as well as uh, they also created a program for galleries uh, like a first uh, in Europe or maybe around the world residency for galleries where they invite galleries uh, from different country for one year to create a program for artists. Uh, Beside that, they hold that uh, artist in residency program as well. And uh, that was something that I applied for, but at the same time, they uh, really appreciate my work too. And uh, I believe that when it comes to applying for good residencies, it's also important to do its, the research and uh, find out whether the work I make, people I want to meet and uh, place I want to be actually uh, suits my paintings, my personality. So that's something I always look at. Uh, I don't just blindly apply for things. I'm trying to be selective about that. How do you go about determining whether or not it's a good fit for your personality? For instance, uh, with uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, before I applied, I just um, checked what kind of city it is and uh, very much uh, reminded me of uh, Manchester, UK, where I spent uh, 10 years. And this city goes right now through a lot of uh, economical problems. They're facing lots of immigration from uh, Mexico as well as other countries. And that's something that's always uh, bouncing in my work constantly, um, as my work tends to be very political or touches uh, like a social problems. Uh, and I thought at that time when I read uh, about Reading that I will be able to make something here that will uh, do great impact on my work as well as a, a residency program. Mm. And so you're you're in the middle of that program right now, aren't you? Uh, yes. This is my uh, second week right now, and I really love it. What are you getting? I mean, I know it's very early, but what are you? What have you gotten out of it so far? Um, so I uh, decided uh, before I um, came here, when I was doing that research, once I got to know that I received that uh, opportunity to be here, I decided to do a project uh, which relates to minimum wage. So um, uh, minimum wage of uh, Pennsylvania is uh, 725 right now. Oftentimes, and I know that also from my own skin, that um, that's one of the examples that we can go with. When uh, people um, migrate into a new country, then, then usually the lowest paid job is the entry job for the country. So uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons is... Uh, not knowing the language and uh, not knowing the culture. 
And uh, usually over the time, uh, once you get to know language, uh, a little bit of culture, then you can get around and chase your dreams. And that's something that happened with me too when I went to UK as a young person. I didn't really know much about uh, the UK as well as I was not able to speak much of, uh, of an English. So that was one of the difficulties. And I think that uh, minimum wage reflects that too. And that's directly referred to Reading, Pennsylvania, where they receive a lot of uh, immigrants as well as uh, a city struggle um, financially or economically right now. The second reason is also that that I thought uh, recently about is that that 725 project means that people who um, face these uh, challenges, they will be able to afford my work through an entire uh, period of residency. So I decided to do uh, 64 paintings, which is one painting a day. I'll be creating this painting within one hour. So exactly the hour that uh, minimum wage uh, people get. The idea is that when artists are emerging from their school, and that was at least in my case, I receive a lot of opportunities. Since I graduated from my BA, my work was constantly selling and my prices were going up. And uh, I remember that a few years after my graduation, I faced that, uh, maybe not a challenge, but I uh, realized that once the price is going up, the um, limit of uh, collectors who can afford it uh, starts uh, shrinking because um, they are collectors who buy to a certain budget. And then if they can't reach the budget, then they're looking for other younger artists whose uh, work is more affordable. And uh, it's not a problem, and I don't think that uh, it's like an um, issue or anything like that, but that's something to think about. I remember one person was always was saying to me, don't go with your prices uh, too high, too fast and be steady and that's something i i kept that advice in my in my head for a long time and i was trying always to maintain that uh, slow growing process instead of rapid grow and then nothing happens so for this 725 project is that what you're selling these pieces for the 64 pieces that you create while you're there yes exactly that's a 725 so uh, the person uh, who uh, buys it basically have an agreement with me in uh, saying that uh, purchase it for this price, but uh, for a certain time of time, they can resell it under the value of usual prices I sell. And I think that uh, for me, it's important to connect with a community. So I could just come for or the, another residency, like um, I feel like that's what happens to us. most of the artists going to residency. They're going there to maybe take their time off from whatever reasons or going there just to make a new body of work and hoping that the residency itself brings some sort of great change in their life, which I don't personally believe that it happens that way. I don't think that that's the reason for doing that. The residency. What is your reason for doing the residency? Uh, it's just uh, making some sort of impact on the community that uh, will make them remember me as that person who made this project that directly engage and impact the community. So um, the proceeds from the sellings of those 64 paintings uh, will go for the Google Works uh, uh, scholarship fund which uh, I'm hoping that maybe in the near future will create a small opportunity for a young person that maybe in the future will be a great artist. We don't know that. I think that that's by being here, I already received a lot. And I think that now it's my time to give back in a form of work and uh, idea uh, that I presented and uh, executing right now. I like it. That's brilliant. If you were going to describe your work to somebody who hasn't seen it before, what kind of, how would you describe it? So for people who are listening to the podcast and haven't ever seen it, what should they envision? I usually start from uh, the sentence saying that my work is uh, a combination of figurative and abstract elements 
that uh, goes together in in one painting. That uh, painting explores the idea, the problems, political problems or social problems uh, in our society. That's probably, in my opinion, the easiest way to describe it. Mm Mm-hmm. Can you talk about the process that you go through when you're making a piece of work? So, for example, these you've got a beautiful time constraint. I don't know how long it normally takes you to do a painting, but um, I kind of love the idea that you're just going to do these paintings in one hour. How are you approaching that, and how is it different from how you normally work? That uh, changes a lot. Uh, It depends uh, what deadlines I have or what shows are I have uh, coming up and uh, what's the demand uh, for my work. I think that um, it can be from one day to like uh, two weeks to finish one piece. That's how it, how it works. I like to start with uh, some images. So I usually try to photograph something and use my own, my own source or just find something online and use that as a reference point for my paintings. And how do you translate that onto a canvas? Like, you mean the image or uh, in what sense? uh... Most of the people who listen to this podcast are artists, and they love to hear exactly how other people paint. There's always, I think, a little hidden jewel or something that can be discovered by the process. So, once you have your your piece of work, do you then do sketches from it, or do you go directly to the canvas and start painting? What, yeah, so the actual process of you painting, what's that like? So I like to uh, prepare my canvases uh, myself, so stretch them, prime them, and uh, when I uh, prepare the canvas itself, it could be prime only with rabbit skin glue or uh, gesso or acrylic primer. And that already gives me an idea, or maybe oil primer, that already gives me an idea how I want to approach the the painting. So I don't do sketches or I don't do any um, photoshopping or nothing like that. I think it's uh, usually just some sort of image, which is not even an exact copy to the canvas. It's just just a reference that uh, helped me start the painting. And unless it refers directly to um, someone as a person that I'm trying to bring on the canvas, could be two years ago I painted uh, paintings uh, of uh, Lech Wałęsa, a former Polish uh, president, who established uh, Solidarność and then brought independence to Poland. So those paintings were a reflection on the um, democracy not only in Poland, like recent events that happened in Poland, but also in the United States. That was around the time of coming Brexit as well as um, election in the United States. So I didn't really at that time directly paint events uh, that happened, but I always look back into history and try to find image or events that might represent uh, current events or current political uh, scene. In that case, I think history helps because, uh, as we all know, history likes to repeat itself. Yeah, <laughs> that must have been, um, you must have had a lot to work with at that time. I think so. And 2017, I think, was um, about that mostly, end of 2016. And then 2017, uh, I think that the body of work I produced was very much related to what's happened. So. What are some of the more memorable reactions that you've had to your work? From other people or just uh, from my own experiences? Mm, Interesting. Let's start with other people and then I want to hear about yours. I found a lot of appreciation for my work. And um, since I graduated uh, in 2011 and then 2012, some of my paintings uh, are described by people that they can be very disturbing. And that there are definitely, some of them are definitely not to hang at home. But I think that uh, the reason for that is that uh, the brush strokes and the subject matter oftentimes can, it's not violent, but can be taken that way. 
So it's uh, not always easy to d digest it um, straight away. So I get uh, a lot of collectors who uh, appreciate that kind of work because uh, they believe that it's something strong and different. And from my own experiences, I just um, think that I need to uh, always stay true to myself in what I want to paint. It's like I have always that debate with uh, my close friends about colors I use in, uh, in paintings. And recently he told me that he looked at my Instagram and he was saying that he sees greens a lot right now. And, and he said, now it's time to change the color skin. And I usually take those uh, kind of uh, comments and think about it through. And I feel like maybe it is uh, time to change my color skin just to refresh myself as a painter, find something new and uh, create something different from what I made like six months ago or a year ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting because I did notice that your feed had a lot of greens in it. That's why I kind of like I laughed when you said that. I don't think it's overwhelming, though. Um, I see you playing with other color combinations. Yeah, I tend to change uh, colors like every six months. Uh, it's not even that someone has to tell me that I think that I do that or over. Like 2016 was very red. And I think 2017 was uh, mostly green. And 2015 was uh, mostly like a brown type of or colorful. It changes a lot. And blue, 2015 was also blue very much. So what's 2018? Uh, right now, um, it's, it's a green, actually. I feel like I, uh, I do green. And, and now I'm uh, like a green blue right now. And I think that uh, maybe I might go away from that. Because I, I noticed... Uh, just a couple of days ago, there is more brown again in my palette. So that might be very interesting. I don't know. <laughs> no, I was wondering if we're in the springtime with your colors, if you're feeling hopeful. Uh, I see. I see. I think it depends more on the subject matter. So um, when I had that uh, red uh, period of the uh, paintings, in, they were focusing on uh, that on, on Lake Valenza at that time. and and uh, reflected democracy. So I felt like red would be good color for that. So that's how I painted everything was red. And I, I think that uh, that reflects also uh, maybe a stage of my mind that uh, this particular color speaks to us. So for instance, when we study color, then we realize that uh, we can touch color to the country like uh, united states is very blue and the flag has a blue color uniforms of uh, policemen is are blue and that actually impacts us as a society too so poland would be very red we have like a red in our flag and maybe also because um, we always were fighting for something so i believe that uh, color reflects uh, the cultures itself and also reflect my paintings. How does blue represent? So blue represents the United States because we have the blue in the flag and the police officers. And you said that red, that you feel like red represents Poland in part because of the flag and in part because as a country, you feel like you're always fighting for something. What do you think the blue in that sense represents just out of curiosity in the United States? I think it's just a color of adventure. I think it was, um, you know, we can make a blue into green very easily or or into blue sky, something we look uh, at all the time uh, with uh, hopes and dreams. I think that that's what uh, the United States stands for from the beginning. It's just about that adventure, experiencing, creating something new. Uh, I feel like uh, that's what it's about, maybe. Mm. Can you describe a time when, with your growth as an artist or with your career as an artist, where you experienced a particular challenge or struggle? I'm curious what that would be and how, uh, more importantly, what you took away from it. Well, I think that um, being an artist is a um, day-to-day or daily base uh, struggle. It feels like um, you step in ladder and you don't see the end of the top of the ladder. 
So it's like if you if I um, accomplish something, this is uh, not the end. This is just the beginning for uh, more to do more work. And it's always about hard work being ahead of uh, other painters or having a great idea that helps to uh, grow the career. When I moved to the United States uh, from the UK, I realized that the United States is uh, it's a huge country. I always knew that it's a uh, big, but actually when I just got here, I realized that actually it's very big. And getting at that time, I lived in uh, Moscow, Idaho. Oh, wow. Very small town, very kind of college community town, very conservative. And I remember that for me, going to New York was like, going from UK to Poland, just like going to a completely different country, spending the same amount of money. And at that time, I realized that I need to think about my career as a, as a business. Basically, this is something that uh, nobody else will do that work for me. And I need to, if I want to accomplish something, I need to do everything, not maybe myself, because without other people I won't be able to accomplish much but it comes to hard work and uh, dedication and uh, showing up every day I started reading a lot of books on uh, art on business on um, website developments on how I followed biographies of other artists which I thought they were very successful like get into those little stories about them how they did it and what they were struggle so I think that that helps a lot. And I think that what I would recommend to every artist or even every person that wants to grow, to have a mentor. I think that that's something that um, helped me a lot, partially because uh, it doesn't have to be a person who criticizes your work, but a person who will look at what I do from the perspective of uh, business. Like I remember a long time ago, like a couple of years ago, one of the uh, people told me, one, one of the mentors, that what if I would consider to do like a entry-level work that is uh, affordable for everybody and how that would change my career? It was just like a conversation, but I remember I, that conversation stayed with me. And I think that uh, now when I was coming to the residency... Yeah, I was going to ask you in what sense. So... In what sense that made you really start to consider the business aspect of it, that just the thought process of essentially running the numbers, right? Of what would I need to produce in order to make enough art that I can make a living and keep it affordable for other people? Yes. Uh, well, making a living is uh, one thing and then creating something that is uh, like a entry art or entry work available for everybody's another thing. So when I came to residency here in Reading, that's what I thought that that 725 project is my entry level work for everybody. That uh, I have a right place, right center, right support, stipend, and opportunity to make something that will open up my door to uh, people of Reading. I think that uh, in every exhibition that artists do, in every work they produce, there must be some sort of strategy. It's not only concept and uh, paint splash on the canvas. It's also a thought and that long game perspective in front of us. That the art or being an artist is just a little bit of playing chess and a long game. That's a great analogy. When you went on that trip from Moscow, Idaho to New York, you said at that point that you realized that you needed to think in terms of a business, yeah? What was it about going to New York that made you understand that? When I visited New York, at that time I won a national competition here in the United States, and I went there for the opening just to see uh, uh, New York because I've never been in New York before and get around and see galleries, what's happening inside. And what made me think that... Uh, being an artist is just basically a business, is that I uh, found there a lot of artists, or those who I talk to, that they all they do is uh, chasing to get a gallery representation. 
which uh, that was also on my mind and still is on my mind. But um, I don't think that that should be a priority. I think that uh, when we look at the big names in the art world, what they did is uh, oftentimes they build a brand with their names first, and then they got to that point where they had a gallery. And in New York, I kind of fell other way around. Like the, everybody is chasing galleries first instead of uh, being in the studio and making good art or producing great idea that people will talk about and then will bring other things, other opportunities. So that's what I found. And I think like at that point, I understood that uh, I actually need to learn about myself a bit more. I need to understand actually what I want to achieve within myself and bring it to the world so the world can respond to what I did and then take actions from there. And I, I guess that's why I started to think about myself, basically, and how to grow, how to learn about things. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's absolutely true that, well, I think artists have a very difficult time saying that their work is a business, like putting art and business, those two words together, I think, is a struggle for a lot of artists. And, and I think the same thing with the brand but when you really take the time to discover who you are as an artist and create work that you are passionate about, then you're going to find the people who are passionate about the same things, or actually they will find you. It's a little bit of both. I agree. It just uh, There was a, a great book I read. I don't remember the title of, of the book right now, but there was uh, something like that saying that uh, create your own religion and then you will find your followers. So create a religion first, believe that it's great, and then the followers will come. And I think the same was uh, with every artist's art. We do need to get to the point that we create something where we really believe that this is going to be great idea, great work, great concept. And then people will come. They will believe in it with the artist. And uh, that's how the name grows and work gets discovered and great things happen, I think. I agree. What are you most proud of with your work? I think that uh, I am uh, motivated. I think that's uh, what makes me uh, proud because uh, being an artist um, and working full-time in the studio is not easy. Is easy task. Uh, you need to be uh, self-motivated to spend long hours. Don't sleep if uh, you don't have to. <laughs> and uh, keep always your eyes open and try to grow every day with uh, what you do and with work, with uh, what's happening around. You know, I I believe that uh, it's true what you said before, that it's uh, very difficult for artists to link those two words, business and art. But I think that we shouldn't distinguish those two things because Work develops very quickly. Like technology develops uh, very quickly, changes almost on a daily basis. I remember when I uh, made my first website 10 years ago, I remember it was like crappy website that uh, I couldn't really update much and I paid a lot of money for. I remember when I came to the United States, I started talking to people uh, where I can learn about uh, developing a website and creating new website, new server, or, or where to get things. And I didn't talk to other artists. I went to people who design websites or graphic designers and um, people who are in the field making those things. And just uh, by grabbing coffee with them, just get to know uh, how I can do it myself. And then once I know that, if I don't have uh, $5,000 to spend on the website, I just spend my nights till 3 a.m. in the morning reading and researching how to do it myself so I can do it myself. And when I have that money, then maybe in the future somebody can do it for me, but I still know what they're doing. It's just like it's like being an Elon Musk in every field, you know, it's just like he's not a physician, but he exactly knows how rocket engine works, you know, and he, when you sit with him uh, and have a conversation, he will tell you that 
I don't need to know like uh, sophisticated uh, physics, but I definitely read enough books to know how the rocket energy works and we can definitely discuss that. So I feel like I try to get to the same point with around my art. So if I think that my art needs something or my studio needs to go in different direction that will lead to something better, then I just spend some time doing it. Mm -hmm. Researching it and doing it. Yeah, it goes back to your point earlier when you said, you know, of course you can't do everything by yourself, but we're always weighing those decisions of how we spend our time and how, you know, I think the more important question a lot of artists don't ask themselves because we tend to be so fixated on money, but we don't often stop to consider the opportunity cost of it. So like you said, when you don't have the money to build a website, you figure out how to get it done yourself. But then, you know, when you can hire somebody who can do it in a quarter of the time that you can, <laughs> and you get to spend, you know, instead of spending all of your nights or two weeks or however long it takes you to build your own website doing that, you get to spend it where your time is more valuable, which is in the studio. And I think people just fixate more on the monetary cost and not on the time cost. I agree with that. And I think that's the good point. But also knowing at least a little bit what is happening, how the things are made, it's also important because... Uh, you can be a part of decision making. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Rather than just rely on somebody else's decisions. Definitely. So, speaking of technology, you mentioned that you have a new magazine that you've started, executemagazine.com. Tell me about that. I founded the magazine last year, but the idea of uh, doing that actually was in my head for a while already. The reason why I did it was I just I oftentimes get emails from a young artist saying like, how wonderful is that you made it? How did you do that? Or emails like, uh, can you help me with this or that? Or how can I do this or other things to get myself accomplished? And, and I think that uh, that's great to get those things, but I think that action is important. So we can look at the other people, what they do and, ask them for advice, but actually action is more important. So at that time, I came up with that idea that how about instead of spending an hour or two replying to those emails, creating a magazine where I can invite other artists, established artists, mid-career artists, emerging artists, and talk with them about those struggles and ask how they do, talk about their work, and uh, invite institutions and organizations to the magazine and uh, talk to people with people who who can tell us something about our market, how they made it. And um, I thought that, that that's maybe the way to go. And um, that was the moment when I decided that I want to do uh, an online magazine. Hmm. Sounds very familiar. What was it, What's been the biggest surprise from Execute Magazine for you, creating it? I think the biggest surprise is um, uh, how much time I need to put in it. So at this point uh, of the magazine, I have uh, two more people who are helping me with uh, interviews and writing the articles, but they are not a full-time people there. So for me right now, the key to grow the magazine is to um, find maybe a partner who will be interested uh, in the idea or in the idea of developing the, the magazine into something much bigger than it is right now. I think right now the magazine is um, just founded by me and um, whatever expense it comes with, it comes from my pocket. And um, now I'm just uh, taking my time. I'm not in a rush. This is just something that is developing and I still think and talk to people how I can develop this uh, concept and uh, where to go with it. And then maybe at some point try to find people who can uh, support it uh, by um, being a partner or, or bringing a new vision to a magazine. So 
uh, that's definitely something developing right now. And uh, it's in early stages, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think we often underestimate, and thankfully so, otherwise we would never do anything, <laughs> what it takes to create something. I for sure had that experience with this podcast, <laughs> where it sounds like such a great idea, and then you start doing it, and you're like, wow, that really is a lot of work. And then you find your way. Yes. I think of magazine as a part of my legacy for other people and other artists. So I want to uh, make this platform accessible for talented uh, people uh, who can um, bring their voice there and uh, through that also develop uh, their careers. Mm. I think it's very much needed. So I'm glad you're doing it. Thank you. So with that in mind, and with your own experiences, what habit do you have that you feel like contributes most strongly to your success? Hard work, I think, if you can call it habit. Can we call the hard work a habit? Is that possible? I think so. Yeah, because I think you can also call the opposite, laziness, a habit too. It's the behavior that we fall into. All uh, right. So yeah, maybe maybe I should rephrase and say that fighting procrastination every day. So when I have my day, I usually try to think of it as um, the last day of my life. So when I think about it, then I start thinking like, what can I do now to accomplish my one day goal, Sunday goal and today goal? And uh, that helps. me. So there are ideas for Sunday. So Sunday, I want the magazine to be a great platform and something big and uh, something that is for other artists. And Sunday, I want my art to be in uh, museums, uh, in uh, art history books. And uh, I want my art to be remembered as something that changed the painting world. I don't know. So that's like a Sunday goal. And then I kind of cut it down to those daily goals. And I think that uh, on the bottom of it is just hard work. So that's, I would say, my habit to stay focused. Have you read the book, The One Thing? I did uh, read that uh, book. <laughs> I was going to say that sounds very, it sounds uh, similar. Not the mm -hmm. same, but very similar. Yeah, it was a very popular book, I think, a year ago, two years ago. Yes. When you say that you've, you're fighting every day against procrastination, what are some of the tactics that you use to get yourself up and going again when you feel like you just don't want to do it? Or do you feel that way? I have my um, anxieties and uh, sad days, depressed days. Um, yeah, it definitely uh, happens. But uh, I think that uh, when I feel that I don't accomplish what I want to accomplish. I feel like that motivates me more. So I think that I just uh, try to stay with my emotions with them and cope with it by just doing the work. I think that I think that what uh, we need to distinguish is that there is lots of potential in saying things. But at the end, if we want to work toward that, it stays only as a potential. So... I don't know if that would be an answer to the question, but I just think that uh, I actually am got lost now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree with that 100%. I think that there's so many ideas out there and we all have hundreds, thousands, probably millions of ideas. I know I have um, far too many ideas than I can actually execute. And I think that action begets action and sloth begets sloth. So for speaking for myself, I know if I sit down on the couch and I start to feel lazy, I have to kind of force myself to get up and do something. But just getting up and moving, like just the simple act of walking to the other side of the room is the literal and figurative first step. And it gets that motion started and then I'm going. But if I just sit there, there's the potential for me to just sit there for hours, <laughs> you know, and being aware of that and just doing something to get going, whatever that is, usually causes the sort of snowball effect or the avalanche to happen that once I actually physically get moving or once I actually just pick up a pen and start drawing or 
pick up a pen and start writing, then all the ideas start to flow out. And it's the smallest step that I can take that prevent that from happening that you just talked about of these ideas, all this potential not being realized. When I think of like, what is the smallest thing that I can do? And just do that. The next thing I know, I've been, you know, it's been eight hours painting and I'm in heaven. Yeah. And there is also definitely other side to it too, that um, sometimes it's also maybe good to be a little bit lazy too, because it allows you to digest what you did. Like, so I, I believe that I have that moment too. Uh, now, uh, when you were saying that uh, I was, uh, I realized that I remember I went uh, uh, once to Japan for a vacation and I remember that I couldn't rest because I just forgot how to rest. You know, I, I constantly wanted to do some work or if I was not able to be in the studio, maybe I can just uh, work on computer and uh, send some emails. You know, it's always work that can catch you. But finding that balance uh, is also very important. Very much so. And I think especially now because we fool ourselves into thinking that we're resting and that we're allowing our ideas to percolate when we, you know, spend however much time looking at our phones, scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And I think for real rest and sort of the percolation of the ideas and to allow your brain and your creativity to reset, you have to literally do nothing. <laughs> You know, be out in nature, just look at the blue sky, look at what's around you, and notice things. And those are all the dots that we later connect that become our artwork or the idea, even if it's not something we visually saw, it's the fact that we allow our minds to be inactive, or I was about to say bored. I don't think that's quite right. But I think that's something that we're we're losing now as people because we the second we don't have something to do, we go. most people tend to go to their cell phones and, and stare at them and look for something to distract them rather than allow thoughts to happen in their mind. Right. Yeah, that's definitely happening. Yes. So you've got eight more weeks in Reading, Pennsylvania. How does that residency and are you, I'm assuming you're having a show and that people can go, you know, if there's anybody and there's lots of people actually <laughs> in the area <laughs> that would like to see your work, where do they go and how do they, how do they do that? People can uh, come to visit my studio if they uh, want to during the residency. At the end of the residency program, there will be an exhibition uh, with uh, works that are produced uh, during the residency. Also, the 725 project is on daily basis, so that painting is always on display. A new painting is always on display between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. at the lobby of uh, Google Works. And people basically can come and see that uh, straight away. So they can have that, I would say, not exhibition, but changing kind of uh, spotlight uh, of the painting every day. Nice. Is it Google Works or Google Works? It's Google Works. Google Works. Yeah. But that's it. Uh, if anybody who's interested in it, it's at goggleworks.com. That's G O G G L E W O R K S dot org. And then, of course, you can you can find your work on Instagram and at your webpage. And all of that will be linked to in the show notes for this episode. So Bartosz, thank you so much for talking with me. It's been really fascinating. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what comes out of this residency for you and how it impacts the community. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it was very nice to just talk with you and actually see um, things from a different angle that I maybe uh, haven't thought about before. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast with Bartosz Beta. As always, to see examples of his work or find links to connect with him, go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes there with examples of his paintings and links to any artists that we talked about in this episode. 
Now you can connect directly with me and a group of seriously dedicated artists in Growth Studio, my ongoing mentorship program. This month, I'm opening a few more spots in Growth Studio. So I know that Growth Studio isn't for everyone, but if you want all the details, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshops to learn more. Growth Studio is a place for artists who understand that this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's for artists who are willing to invest the time to hone their skills and push past the crappy painting so they can discover who they are as an artist. It's a place where artists can get honest feedback from their peers, exchange ideas, and ask the burning questions that pop up late at night when we're alone in the studio, when even the cat has stopped pretending to care. Look, you know you can't watch a free video on YouTube, throw some paint on a canvas, and call yourself the next Picasso. If that's what you're hoping for, Growth Studio is definitely not for you. But if you're one of those artists who refuses to give up, who stubbornly persists even when you're not in the mood, and sees excellence as non-negotiable, then head over to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshops to learn more and apply to Growth Studio.